Think about the salvation we have through the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, ladies. Thank God for that. We will hear that again soon, God willing. 1 Samuel, if you'll go there with me in the Word of God, it's 1 Samuel 30 this evening. 1 Samuel chapter 30, we're moving along in our study of the life of David. And debated whether to share this this evening or uh, to preach this next Lord's Day. And I believe God would have us to hear this this evening, God willing. Uh, two Sundays ago, we dealt really with 1 Samuel 27 and then 29 as David's found himself amongst the Philistines and appealing to Achish, the king of the Philistines, to be able to live there in Ziklag and to serve with them and to, and to spend his life there against God and against God's people. It's an unusual thought for us to consider when we admire David so much, a man after God's own heart. And here now, as we've alluded to uh, a couple of weeks ago and even somewhat this morning, the, the, the sin of David, the, David's choices are now costing him really an ultimate price in his home and family. And it's, it's, it hits him deep, deeply in his heart here. Look with me at the end of chapter 29, if you will, please, in 1 Samuel. And it says here, So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning to return into the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. So the Philistines were going up to meet with Saul, as Saul was worrying about this morning, as we dealt with that passage in God's word. And Saul really just in a desperate, terrible situation, not knowing what to do. And now David is headed back to Ziklag, the town that he had requested of Acres, this country town in the south there, away from so many things. And he's going back home. These men are, these 600 men are going back to their wives, going back to their children, going back uh, to see what's there, to refresh their relationship and to move forward and see what's going to happen. In verse number one of chapter 30, for there we say amen. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved every man uh, for his sons and for his daughters but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God and David said to Abiathar the priest Ahimelech's son I pray thee bring hither the ephod and Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David and David inquired at the Lord saying shall I pursue after this troop shall I overtake them and he answered pursue for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail, recover all. So David went, he and his 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, uh, where, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and the 400 men, for 200 men abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and, came and gave him bread and he did eat and they made him drink water and they gave him a piece of cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, to whom belongest thou and whence art thou? And he said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. And my master left me because three days agone I fell sick. We made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites and upon the coast which belongeth to Judah and upon the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag with fire. And David said unto him, Canst thou bring me down to this company? And he said, Swear unto me by God that thou wilt neither kill me nor deliver me into the hands of my master, and I will bring thee down to this company. And when he had brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day. And there were escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. And I love this verse, and David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives, and there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. David recovered all. I want you to underline that. Take note of that. David recovered all. 
David had lived now 16 months in the land of the Philistines as we've been teaching and preaching and studying about. That's a, that's a long time to be out of God's will. That's a long time to be away from the Lord. I'm glad to know this, that the Lord never gave up on this man. By the way, I remind you, God's no respecter of persons. He's not giving up on you. He's still pursuing you. He's still waiting for you to return. 16 months in the land of Philistia, living there in Ziklag, he'd almost gone to war against his own people with Philistia. And now, no doubt, I'm sure he felt a bit of relief as that was behind him now, not by his choosing, but by the, by the sovereign hand of Almighty God. He was rejected by the Philistines. You'll remember, as he came with Achish, King Achish had an affinity for David and for what David could do, the, Philistia king, the Philistine king. And, and David came with, with Achish to go to battle against God's people. And those, those military leaders said, wait a second, we, we can't trust this guy. <laughs> We're not taking him with us to fight against Israel. Let's let him go. And sure enough, they did. No doubt there's some relief. Soldiers have been away for a while from wives and from children, been away from the home and sleeping in their own bed and eating that home-cooked meal. And, and they were ready to march back over the land about three days' journey, 25 miles a day, to get back home to Ziklag. But David returned to Ziklag only to find tragedy. Tragedy. You know, we as Christians at times can follow in David's footsteps, and we, we, get off, we get off the course that God has for us. We lose our passion for the Lord, our heart for God. We become, if we're not careful, we, we check all the boxes and do all the stuff. But our heart for God is waning, and it is not, not what it ought to be. Anybody know what I'm talking about here tonight? We get away from the vision that God has for us and for our lives. We don't, we don't, we don't have the love for God that we had before. But a lot of it grows out of our weariness and that, that well-doing, and we become so weary, and we get our eyes off the Lord. This is where David has been now for some time, at least 16 months. And the Lord will use this circumstance, this tragic circumstance in Ziklag, not to just uh, re reunite David with his wife, with his wives, excuse me, with his children, and not for his men just to be reunite, reunited with their families, but for David to experience revival in his own heart. Thank God for revival. Thank God for a God that continues to reach out for us, that helps us, helps us to be refreshed and renewed and return to our first love. Thank God he doesn't leave us when we turn our back on him. And I'm glad to say this, that no matter how far you go, no matter how low you may go, there is a way back to God, and his door is always open to his children, always open to his children. And we thank God for that truth. How unworthy we are for the Lord to keep the light on for us, <laughs> to keep the way open for us, to keep the door unlocked so you and I could return home. But first, as we think about this tonight in the first few verses of this chapter, number one, I want us to consider David's reaping. David's reaping. David is reaping what he has sown now for at least 16 months. And make no mistake about it, though there is pleasure in sin for a season, you and I know that when we sow the seeds of sin, we will reap the horror of it. We'll reap the scars of it. We'll reap the judgment of it. That's how this life works, and God, a loving God, will not let us go away forever. But we see here the beginning of David's reaping, and it goes all the way back to 1 Samuel 27. I know we've been dwelling in these passages for the last several days, the last several weeks, but go back there with me to 1 Samuel 27. We see that David, this mighty warrior, is wavering in his faith, wavering in his commitment to Almighty God. And he's getting ready to reap from his wavering. He's growing weak. We understand that Saul had relentlessly pursued David for years now. Some commentators say at least eight, maybe, maybe up to 15 years or more that David's been on the run. And there's every reason for him to grow weary. He had been hunted like a madman, and, he and, his ar and, and Saul's army had been determined to kill David. We know that. And we read there back in chapter 27 and verse 1, And David said in his heart, David's talking to himself. By the way, take note that he's not talking to the Lord. In chapter 30, he begins to talk to the Lord. In chapter 27, he's talking to himself. He says to himself something that's not true, but it felt like it was true. I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should speedily escape the land of the Philistines, and Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. And what we see here is David's thinking is contrary to God's thinking. David is wrong and God is right. That's always true there. If you and I think differently than the Lord, he's always right. His word's always right. David is thinking in contrary to God's promises to him. 
God had made a promise to him back in 1 Samuel 16 when he was anointed that he would become the next king of Israel under the hand of the, of the prophet Samuel. And, that we, I mean, and it was God's word. God had given his word on this. When God gives us his word, we can believe and trust the Lord. Amen. I encourage you. I want to say this to you again. I hope you don't mind me repeating this. But if you need to make a decision, you need to find a way in life. Don't inquire only of yourself. Certainly you need to think. Use the brain that the good Lord gave us. Amen. We need to do that. But more important than that, we need to align up with God's word and find a green light in the word of God. If you're going to go somewhere, you're going to do something, don't do it of your own accord. Don't do it because you've been offered a promotion or an opportunity or some, something awaiting over over there. Make sure that this is God's way for you and your family and your life. There's been so many people. I can name lists of people that have come out of this church and moved in different directions. And, and I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to besmirch their reputation or, or trying to impugn their, their integrity at all. But I'm trying to tell you this. In my humble estimation, they, they, they should have inquired of the Lord. They should have inquired of the Lord, and you and I could be in the same boat. David's there. He, he, he's, he's not. Listen, when we read 1 Samuel 27, 28, and 29, there is no mention in those chapters of David of, of anything about the Lord coming off of David's lips or in his mind. He is operating apart from God's word and God's will. And let's just, again, remind ourselves who David is. He's a man after God's own heart. You and I. I don't know, I can't speak for you, but I don't even belong in that club. I have not, I'm, not, I'm not a part of that club. By the way, I don't, I don't think, you, I think you can apply for that. Only God gives passage into that sort of <laughs> esteemed group, so to speak. There's more to be said about that. But there's no mention of God in David's decision, no mention of the Lord from Psalm, uh, 1 Samuel 27 until we get into, into the middle here of, of chapter 30. And the, you know the only person that mentions the Lord is Achish. <laughs> He, 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 he believes that God's hand is on David's life, and he's right about that. David here is not seeking what the Lord has for him in this major change of direction. And could I implore you, my friends, I could implore you, if we have a major change of direction in your life, inquire of the Lord. Do that. And make sure it aligns with God's will and not just your feelings. And I'm not just talking about finding another church or another job. I tell you what, a lot of people have excused their feelings for finding another spouse, for finding an, an, another family, for doing all sorts of things in life. I'm telling you what, if it doesn't line up with God's word, it is wrong. Find your green lights, find your red lights, find your caution lights, your yellow lights in the word of God. And unless God says go, don't go. Be clear about that. David, no doubt, he was tired. He had come up with this human solution to get him out of the pressure. He took his human solution. And again, we, we rehearsed to the fact that it seemed to work because in chapter 27, verse number 4, Saul, Saul wasn't pursuing him anymore. And every, every once in a while, uh, we, we think we've done something right and, and we've gotten a blessing out of it, but he couldn't be more wrong. His wavering led to a lot of wreckage in his life. Look, look with me and as it, we come back now to uh, chapter, uh, chapter 30. If you'll go back there with me in 1 Samuel, these very... The first few words say, and it came to pass. It didn't just happen by accident. God had a purpose in all that was going on in David's life. And he had a love for David, a desire for David. And he didn't intend for David to walk away without God getting his attention. And we say, praise the Lord for that attribute of our almighty God. He had a purpose for David's life and all this. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day. I mentioned a moment ago, they, they were making about 25 miles a day in their march. They would arrive there tired and hungry as they were coming over the, the hill there, maybe coming over the hill to Ziklag. And they, 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 they were thinking about the home-cooked meals that they were getting ready to partake of and the children who would greet them and the wives who would greet them in the glad reunion day. And maybe they even saw a little smoke rising in the distance. Maybe, maybe they thought that was the, the meal, that the favorite favorite dish that they were thinking of and they oh I cannot wait to have some of that they had their sights set set on something else but what they saw when they came over the hill was wreckage their 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 city their little town was completely engulfed in flames and everyone they knew everyone they loved was gone Everyone they cared for, everything that meant something in life, the people that they probably thought they were fighting for and living for and breathing for had given themselves to these people were gone it's hard to imagine that God would touch us in the softest, most tenderest, most tender spots of our lives. 
but he'll touch you even in those areas and the people that you love dearly and hold on to dearly. And if we're not careful, I can be guilty of this, we can put those precious people in our lives even above the Lord in our lives. He will touch those tender areas and remind us that he's the giver of life, he's the giver of family, he's the giver of all these things. And the only way for us to have that home and family is the way it ought to be is for God to give us to give God his rightful place. The place was burning, and no doubt that, that got their attention, but what hurt them was the fact that their wives, their sons, their daughters were now taken captive. They were gone. They were nowhere to be found, and, and their wavering led to this wreckage, and look what it leads to now, great weeping. These grown men are crying like babies. Grown men are broken Verse number four, if you look there with me, and David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept, listen to this, until they had no more power to weep. I want, to understand, I want you to understand again, this is, a, this is the judgment of God, but it's a gift of God. David and his men came into these cities. Their hearts were brightened to think about what was there, but it burned with fire. In the distance, they came to realize something that was wrong and, and, and what would happen now to their wives and their children. And David and the people there, were, they, they wept until they had no more power to weep. All was lost. David had no one to support him, no one in Israel to help him. The Philistines were against him. His family was gone. All that he owned had been consumed. Now, look at here, even his friends are turning against him. Look, and in verse number 6, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Even David's friends turned against him here. These men that looked up to David, that had, that had joined David, these misfits of society, and now become his mighty men. You remember our study of these men. They, their lives have been revolutionized, but they were very emotional in this moment, and they needed somebody to blame. And they looked at David and said, what? What did you do? You have caused all of this. And David found, you know, I think David probably enjoyed the fact these 600 men looked up to him. They admired him. They practically worshipped the ground he walked on. If he said jump, they said, how high? If they, it was something to be done, they were looking to join in with him and get it done no matter how fierce, no matter how tough it would be. And now those men that seemed to have an undying allegiance to him and were turned their back. David was all alone, but thank God he was finally looking to the Lord. Amen. And that's God will touch us in the most tender spots of our life. He will take away all our props, all, all the things that will keep us going, all the things that we've started living for beside God, even the people we've begun to live for beside Almighty God. And he will bring us to our place where we're all alone until we will recognize our need for him. That feels like the worst punishment in the world. Again, but it's in God's love that he does this. Every support system was gone except the Lord. And David was not in a bad place. My friend, he was in the greatest place. He was, he was there with God on his mind and with God's eyes looking on him. David, David didn't weep again just because he'd lost everything. And David, I want to say this, David didn't weep just because he lost everyone. I want you to know, God will go that far to get our attention. God will take you that far. But David realized it wasn't just about the stuff and it wasn't just about the people. He knew that he bore responsibility for all this taking place. I referred to just, uh, just, just a few days ago as we were in one of our messages, I remember if it was last Lord's Day or this past... Uh, this past Wednesday evening, but uh, Jonah, when Jonah, when the storm came and Jonah was in the boat and the storm was tossing the boat, Jonah knew he was the man. Jonah knew he was the problem. David had this kind of moment. They realize as these, my wife and my wives and my kids are gone. These men are missing their families because I have disobeyed the Lord. If you're going to lead a family, I'm telling you what, just be reminded, when you get off the path of God, you're going, to, you're going to bring a whole lot of people with you in the wrong direction. Some of us endeavor to lead a church, a pastor a church, or to do something like that for the Lord. I want you to know, you and I get off the path that God has called us to, and we have the propensity to lead other people in that wrong direction away from God. May God deliver us from that. But I'll tell you what, you, 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 can, you can do it. You could do it. But thank God, God's not going to leave us alone. 
He was David greatly hurt, greatly distressed. He's about as low and as backslidden state as a man could go. And he's backsliding like you can't believe. He's like the prodigal son who's sitting in the pig pen of life. But thank God the father is ready to welcome him home. It was terrible, by the way, when a Christian falls into such a position that we give the enemies of Almighty God an opportunity to blaspheme our God and to despise his servants. You know, uh, we think about our own testimony, but my friends, could we think about the testimony of Almighty God for just a moment? When you and I stand up for the Lord, but, but then we fail the Lord, let's not give those who are against God an opportunity to besmirch the name of God. David sits there, and the 16 months, or maybe more, have flown by. This has happened, and that has happened, and, and, and good, good days and difficult days. He's almost turned his back on his own people, and he's asking himself in these moments, no question, how in the world did I get here? How did I get here now where my family is gone and my friends are against me? How in the world did I? I'm supposed to be the king. God called me to be the king. He anointed me to be the king. How did I get so low? He got there by disobeying the Lord. It's that simple. Saw, how did King Saul get there this morning where he's out trying to find a medium to conjure up the spirit of prophet Samuel to give him some direction? How would he get that far when just, a, just years before he'd kicked all those witches and wizards out of the land according to the law of God? I'm telling you what, he, he, don't, he didn't know how he got there. He was so desperate he's willing to do anything. And that's what happens to us as believers. We ask ourselves, how do we get there? And let's be honest, without, we don't have to get into all the details tonight, but I know how we get there. It starts with the sins of our mind and our heart, my friend. We must keep our mind on the Lord and our heart warm with the truth of God's word. If you and I, if you and I struggle with that, I'm telling you what, you say, well, I'll never do this and I'll never do that. But my friend, you will always go further than you would imagine. You always go lower than you think you could. And now, as I said earlier this day, better Christians than I believe myself to be have fallen farther than I thought they could ever go. Why? Just because we got our mind off of the Lord and our heart wasn't warm to his word. They weren't warm to his word. And I'm telling you what, marriages fall apart. Ministries become full of hypocrisy. People put their hearts and minds and eyes onto things that they should never see. And they have relationships with people they should have never have relationships. They go so far into things that are unbelievable. We see this perfect picture of them. But in their heart, they've left the Lord. They've already gotten into their 16 months of, of turning their back on the God. And listen, when we, it begins with the sins of the, and the secret sins in our heart. And eventually, they become observable not only to God but to everyone else. But when we sin in secret, we understand this. God is our only audience. He is watching. He's taking notice of these things. And, and again, not, not to just judge us and to cast us out, but to draw us back. David, I want you to understand that David, at the moment, he perceived this crushing blow in his life. He, he had to know that it was not something to, to break him necessarily, to crush him, to destroy him. One commentator sent this, said this crushing blow was sent in infinite tenderness to clean him right out of the condition into which he had fallen. The infinite tenderness of God. As we think about what, what the Lord is doing in, in David's life, it's remarkable to think how far he had fallen, how far he was going, and what God was trying to do in his life. But thank God for revival. David experienced revival. Look in verse number 6, the end of it. It says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. Maybe one of the most famous fat, uh, phrases in all the Bible. David encouraged himself in the Lord. And the pathway revival it starts with you getting close to God again. You talking to the Lord again. David encouraged himself. What does that mean? David surrendered and he found strength. His strength made perfect in God's weakness. It took a lot to bring David to this place. But now he's here and he recognizes he has no strength of his own. He can only lean on the strength of Almighty God. This was David in his backslidden and wayward state. Broken and emptied out. But now he's ready to be filled with what God can fill him with. He's a man who is completely weakened after coming home to this burned out ghost town that he knew once knew his home he was weak and he needed the Lord's strength this is what it means to encourage himself in the Lord he's not just using the power of positive thinking not just trying to improve his attitude but he's looking for the strength that only God can give in the heart of a hurting man strength for his brokenness strength for his repentance by the way you and I need God's strength just to admit we're wrong don't we just admit we're wrong I can be so stubborn 
He needed strength for his brokenness, strength for his repentance. He needed strength for the determination to take back what the enemy had stolen from him. He needed that. Mr. Spurgeon said God was beginning to cure his servant by a bitter dose of distress. And the evidence of the cure was that he did not encourage himself by his new friends or by the hope of others coming, but he encouraged himself in the Lord his God. My friend, that's where you and I need to turn. That's who you and I need to turn to. David realized that, by the way, that he'd he'd been very presumptuous in his relationship with God. He'd been very presumptuous in in taking himself out of fellowship with the Lord. He took himself out from underneath the protective hand of Almighty God. As we said just a few days ago, he was not dwelling under the shadow of his wings. He was not dwelling, dwelling under the shelter of his wings. It was Psalm 91 wings. He realizes now that he's gotten out from underneath the protection of Almighty God. And God had no obligation to protect David at this point in life. And the Lord was planning to use the consequences now to bring David to repentance and to seek the Lord. What David said back in chapter 27 and verse 1 had gotten him into a mess as he said in his own heart. And now what he says here in verse 6 of chapter 30, God will use that to strengthen David and help to bring him out. David inquired of the Lord. He inquired of the Lord before he engaged. Look in verse number 8. And David inquired of the Lord saying, shall I pursue after this troop and shall I overtake him? David you know, and by the way, let's just stop for a minute and say, it made complete sense for David to, to round up all of his weapons and to go take his family back. You know, I, I jokingly say this from time to time. My dad used to say this in a joking way. I don't mean to be rude at all, but dad would say this occasionally. Some things you don't even have to pray about, right? And he would say that to me. I'd say, well, I don't know if I want to do that. He'd say, son, some things you don't have to pray about. Usually it was something he told me to do, amen. But uh, I don't have to pray about that. I don't know about you, but somebody took my wife and my kids. I don't even think I need to have a prayer meeting about that. It's time to round up and go get them. It makes a whole lot of sense. Sounds like that's my responsibility as the husband and the father to take care of that kind of business. But David had figured out what, what happens when he does his own thinking. David had already figured out where his logic had taken him, where his feelings had brought him. It brought him to Achish and to the Philistines and to a far country, away from his people and most importantly away from God. And in this state of revival, he was not going to make a move unless God said yes. It made lots of sense, but he was going to ask God first. He was going to ask the Lord first, and he needed to pray about it. In fact, we need to pray about everything. We need the mind of God on everything. And David inquired of the Lord, verse number 8, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, and God's answering, I'll pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. What a sweet promise. What a green light. Boy, you get a green light like that, and I'm telling you why, you're not saving any gas money. You're going to put the pedal to the metal and go. Amen. You're going for it. God said, go! And David is going so David, it says here, David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? You answer and pursue, and thou shalt overtake them, and thou, thou fell shalt recover all. And David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind stayed. He's ready to move. He's ready to go. David's been revived. He's been renewed. He could sing the song, the gospel song we sing around here every once in a while, that I found it all when I lost everything. <laughs> Sometimes that's what God brings us to so we can find everything that he has for us. The Lord promises victory to David over the Amalekites, but also promises recovery, and that's what the Lord is doing. I want you to notice with me, lastly, David's recovery here as we get to verse number 9. We see David's reaping. We see David's revival. Now we see David's recovery. Thank God he will recover all. But it's interesting that it's done the way the Lord wants it done. The way the Lord wants it done. How many of you believe God's way is the best way? Now it's up to us to decide if it's going to be the only way for us. And God does something wonderful here in David's life. David went, he and the 600 men, verse 9, were with him, came to the brook Besor, where those that were left behind and stayed. But David pursued, he and the 400 men, the 200 abode behind, which were so faint, they could not go over the brook Besor. I mean, this was a very hard time for people, very emotional. And look what happened. Of all people in the world that God would use, David doesn't know where to go. I mean, he's ready to go. He's going to charge hell with a squirt gun. I mean, he's going to, he's going to, take, his, he's going to take his sling and five stones and go, go attack this army if he needs to, all by himself if he has to. But God's leading. And God would look here. Look who he uses, church. He found him in what? An Egyptian in the field. Now, now you tell me, if you're, if, you're, if you're an Israelite, the first person you're looking to ask help from, is it an Egyptian? 
No, no, there's not a natural kinship there. (laughs) And they found an Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread, and he did eat, and they made him drink water, and he gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. And when he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he'd eaten no bread, no drunk, no water, three days and three nights. And David said unto him, To whom belongest thou? So it's one thing to know he's from Egypt. He says, He says, I'm a young man of Egypt. I'm sure some people in the crowd went, Oh, just like that. <laughs> That's what you and I would do. And then he says this, servant to an Amalekite. And it was a double, <gasps> a double enemy. But God's working. He said you're going to recover. But before David could man up and, 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 uh, and ammo up and get everything up that he needed, God said, you're going to recover, but you're going to re- I'm going to do it for you. <laughs> I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to provide the way, and I'm going to do it. And again, when God does this in the most unlikeliest of ways to the most unlikely people, then we've learned through the years. That's where he gets our attention. That's where he gets the glory. And then our testimony is all about what God has done, not what we accomplished. Amen? And that's what takes place here. And I'm 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 a man of Egypt. Oh, my goodness. A servant to an Amalekite. Oh, my goodness. And on top of that, he was right there when they burned Ziklag to the ground. Now, under normal circumstances, we'd have, we'd have flogged this young man and probably relieved him of his head, chopped his head off. We would have punished him. He was, he, he, was, he was aiding and abetting at least what was going on here. He was an accomplice to what had taken place in David's life, and his family was gone and everything burned down. But David knew that God was at work. You know what he found there in this man? What we like to say around here is a little, a little Psalm 86, 17, a token for good. He found something. He hadn't found his family yet, but he knew God was leading him in the right direction. God's sovereignty had been seen in this. He just happened to come upon this Egyptian who had been discarded by the Amalekites, who, the ones who had burned everything up. It's, it's a great comfort to know that however bleak our situation is, our sovereign God is still on his throne. He's ordained all things, even the little details of our life, to display his might on our behalf when we trust him. When we trust him. And we, we see what, what the Lord is doing. It's a mighty thing to consider what God is doing here. There's hope. that He received hope here, a token for good. And I love the fact that we see the home, the homes that were restored. This is what David was going after. David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. David would rescue his two wives. He got his family back. We see what happened here. David asked the, the, the young man to take him to the encampment, and they snuck up on these people, and they were having the time of their life, partying like there was no tomorrow because of all their success in battle. And look what happened there in verse number 17. And David smote them from the twilight even until the even of the next day. How about that? 24 hours of just mowing them down. Excuse me. 24 hours of driving the enemy out. But he wasn't doing it to his own satisfaction. He was doing it unto the glory of Almighty God. He's doing it under the hand of Almighty God. He smote them from twilight even unto the evening. I don't know, as a man, that just makes me happy. He just fought them for 24 hours and whooped them and whooped them and whooped them and whooped them. Oh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Amen. And God, God was showing himself mighty. God was showing himself mighty. And there escaped not a man of them, save 400 young men, which rode upon camels and fled. Interesting note there. And David, verse 18, recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and David rescued his two wives. And there was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil, nor anything they had taken to them. Why? Because of the grace of Almighty God, the goodness of Almighty God, for the glory of Almighty God, David recovered all. David recovered all. It's interesting what God was doing. God was at work giving David his family back. What a beautiful ending. Daddy and mama and the babies are back home together. It's a beautiful ending, but God was doing more than that. God was doing more than that. That's a beautiful answer to prayer. But God was reviving this man. God was at work bringing his wayward warrior back long before the fires of Ziklag had pierced his heart. 
God was at work when David is back turned and God was working to bring him back. God was graciously acting on David's behalf to give him the throne of Israel. He used the Philistine commanders to get David out of a compromising position and situation. At the very moment that David and his men were lamenting the destruction of Ziklag, God was using the Philistines, to, by the way, to remove Saul so that David could become king. Here in just a few verses, Saul is dead and David is on his way to Jerusalem. To finally be the king that he had been anointed to be. David had no idea when the fires were burning. And then when the Egyptian boy was leading him there and he was recovering his home. He had no idea that God was about to do what he's about. David had come as close to leaving God's plan for his life as you could get. Turning his back on the Lord. At the very last moment it had gotten very, very dark. But the dawn was getting ready to break in just a few hours. He would be the king. He would be where God had called him to be. And he almost sinned it all away. Because he lacked trust in God. But I want you to know when we fail, God doesn't fail. God was putting things together. Even the loss of Ziklag was God's provision. It destroyed David's roots in that foreign country, in that place he was not supposed to be. God destroyed his home in Ziklag so he could give him the throne in Jerusalem, my friend. He opened up the way for him to move on. More than that, God was working to restore David's fellowship with him. And whether David was on the throne or not, God wanted to be close to that young man. And God wants to be close to us. God was working to restore fellowship between David and himself. More than a place, more than a position, David was able to draw near the divine person, God himself. A dear Pastor Sexton back in Tennessee used to preach a message. He would say it this way, the road to Jerusalem goes through Ziklag so often in our lives. The, the road to the place that God has established for us will go, through the, will go through these deep waters and we must learn to trust the Lord then before we arrive. And we can trust him. You know, David started out walking by faith in this journey, anointed as king. Uh, he trusted the Lord for his strength, for his hope. He trusted uh, the Lord uh, to, to provide for him and per- to protect him. But the duration of the trials, the severity of the trials, him t- caused him to take matters into his own hands uh, trying to preserve himself, he moved his family and, and his men to Philistia, and he began to serve Achish, the king of Philistia, again, the enemies of God and the people of God. But David finally came to repentance. He came to the end of himself. He tasted the consequences of his own sin and the choices that he had made for his life. David, David, what, what, what was the problem? David had lost his passion for God, his passion for God's call on his life. His, his, he lost his vision for what God was doing And then we have to ask ourselves, Lord, have I lost that passion for what you have for me? Once we get our eyes off of that vision, we get our eyes out of that, we get our heart away from that passion, we we lose our our, our awe in worshiping the Lord. We lose our excitement for praying to him and for, for promoting the gospel and leading people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our fire dims for doing the work that God's given us to do because of his salvation for us. One commentator said this is so many times in a church, there's a dilemma between either having a revival or a funeral. <laughs> we have a hard time existing <laughs> anywhere in between there, don't we? God help us, as he continues to say, to rend our hearts before the Lord, to repent, and ask him to, to place the fire of passion in our hearts. There's a song that says, whatever it takes to draw closer to you, Lord. That's what I'll be willing to do. Take my houses, my lands, take my dreams and my plans. Lord, I'm placing my whole life in your hands. Can we trust the Lord with that tonight? God's not going to leave you alone. In love, he will continue to trouble you until you come to the place where you trust him. And when you do, I really believe God will allow us to recover all. David recovered all because of the goodness of Almighty God. May God help us to choose God's way for our life as well. We bow our heads in a word of prayer this evening. What a powerful passage of Scripture.